The views and opinions of the hosts and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the position of the management and staff of Guardian Network. Welcome to the Political Review. My name is K. Quincy Parker. It is uh, my extreme pleasure to uh, host you all uh, for what promises to be a, uh, a fascinating and engaging conversation. Uh, the government of the Bahamas is tasked at this time with uh, something uh, that is uh, in terms of managing the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in the wake of uh, recovery efforts from the worst storm to hit the country uh, since we started keeping records. And the, the truth of that does not take away from the politics of it. Uh, the politics of it is the is the, the, the backseat driving, the sideline commentary, the, well, if I was in power, this is what I would have done. Or if, if the decision were mine, these are the choices that I would have made. And, and the truth is that to a large extent, the, the general election that is uh, due by May 10th, uh, 2022, will be how the Minnis administration has handled the uh, has handled the pandemic uh, and the different uh, <laughs> the different outcomes that have been uh, achieved based on their decision making, based on their public education campaign, uh, based on any number of variables, and the truth is that all the prognostication in the world will, in my view, is, is, is almost useless because in the voter's box, uh, it is just the voter and the ballot. And it is really what the voter takes into the ballot box that will determine how, uh, and uh, a part of the, the, the reason that we have these conversations here on, on Sunday afternoons is that uh, I, I want to give context uh, to, to decision making. I want people to understand uh, the, the ramifications. I want them to understand the, the, the choices that have been made and, and, and the outcomes of those choices. I want to be able to present a space where people can cut through the noise and the the propaganda and and hear honest fact-based conversation uh biased depending on the guest obviously people have an agenda that they are they're trying to promote but honest and objective nonetheless uh in politics most recently uh, attributed to uh, the Right Honorable Hubert Minnis, your, Hubert Ingram, sorry. You're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. Uh, and uh, in the same address, uh, Ingram uh, used another phrase that, uh, that I, I, I like, that uh, these are facts and facts are stubborn things. And, and the truth is, that we have uh, we have a situation before us that admits of messing with, messing with the facts. Although the facts are there and, and plain to see, the the interpretation thereof 
is where politicians make their bread and butter. And, uh, and today we are, we are excited that a politician who has a, uh, a reputation uh, for acknowledging and dealing with the facts as they are. And, uh, and, uh, and I think one who some, some, can, uh, some have said may, may have paid a premium for, for that tendency uh, in, in some decisions that have been made on a national level over the last, uh, over the last few months. Uh, today joining us is the former Minister of Health, the uh, Member of Parliament for Elizabeth, who is uh, the incumbent in that constituency and is running to, uh, to maintain his seat against the insurgency of uh, Joe Beth, Senator Joe Beth Williams. And uh, I, uh, is it, it's not, there's another, there's a DNA running in the area whose name I can't recall quite at this time. We'll, we'll get to the, we'll get to the on the ground politics uh, in a while. But uh, before we do that, uh, let's, we, we want to have a high level conversation with, uh, with my guest today, Dr. Duane Sands. Dr. Sands, uh, welcome back to the Political Review. Good afternoon and thank you very much for having me. I, I noticed that you left out in your discussion of facts, uh, a, a new addition to the lexicon, and that is alternative facts. Uh, yeah. that, was, uh, that was described by the erstwhile Republican president, at least his spokespersons. And so, you know, there are facts and there are alternative facts, I understand. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and, and the truth is that... It, what frightens me about that, uh, Dr. Sands, is that there are people in, uh, in, in our community who are uh, with common sense, who, uh, because they have a partisan view one way or the other, are willing to accept uh, alternative facts as just as valid as absolute facts, if I can, if I can invent a term now. Uh, the, the sad truth is, and, and you must be finding this as you're canvassing, the, the sad truth is that people will adopt a set of, uh, a, a set of information uh, and call it factual based almost entirely on, at this point, political persuasion. Uh, and, and then there are, you know, there are those who are capable of reading the science and understanding the science without the scientific background, just based on the sense that, the common sense that God gave them. And those people uh, have made a set of decisions that uh, I, I, you know, I'll leave, I'll, I'll leave the community to judge, but, but it, it's, it, there's, there's an increasing, uh, increasing number of them as well. So uh, as you, as you are walking, let's, let, let's stay high level first. Uh, I, I saw the, the COVID update today and the, the number of confirmed cases nationwide uh, as of today was over 13,000. And I don't think that number has really hit home the people because 13,000 is not a small number. Uh, no. I, I, I put to you that that to an extent, even though there are 10,000 plus cases in New Providence, we've more or less buried our heads in the sand. And I, I, I put that to you as a, as a, a statement and I, I, I covered your response. You know, this is, when we, when we look back at this era, it will become a case study for political science, for sociology, for psychology, for forensic psychology, 
um, because juxtaposition or the collision of a medical problem, COVID, a virus, and a novel method of communication, social media, interspersed with politics. And we have never seen anything like this before. We have never seen a beast like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when you put those things together, you have uh, a creature that defies logic, defies explanation. Behavior uh, is something that you, whether you're talking about the behavior of the policymakers or the uh, even the um, uh, the long-standing public health agencies, uh, the the physicians, the nurses, it's it's bizarre. It is nothing short of bizarre. Mm -hmm. So for the Bahamas to have 13 and a half thousand cases in one day says something. One, it says we are in trouble. Two, it says that things are probably going to get worse. Three, if you drill down into the other components of the dashboard report, it speaks to a health system which is under threat uh, and bursting at the seams with COVID-related care, particularly as you now look at more than 70 hospitalizations and 13 people in the ICU. It also predicts, because we know from worldwide actuarial data, that at least 40% of those people will likely not survive. I'm talking about patients in the intensive care unit. Mm. And that's not, um, you know, we hope and pray that they do well, but um, once people are ventilated and uh, critically 50% of them don't survive. And so it means that that 273 death rate will likely increase further. And yet, we have in Junkanoo rush outs and uh, as I was driving down the street today, I was doing a straw poll of the number of people that I saw wearing masks. And um, the definition of wearing a mask has to be explicit because it's not hanging off your chin, hanging off your ear, balled up in your hand. It is how many people you see wearing a mask covering their nose and mouth. And trust me, they are in the minority. Yeah. So, so last week I had uh, I had uh, Fred Mitchell on on the show uh, to, uh, and one of the things that in asking him how the COVID differently, uh, his his uh, his main criticism was uh, of public education. Um, I. I, I don't want I don't want to put you in the position of agreeing with Fred Mitchell, uh, given that he's your political opponent. But uh, to me, there is a there is some sense to that position. Uh, but there's also the active, and this is one of the questions I wanted to ask you. There's there's an active uh, rejection. It almost seems from the public of the educational efforts of the competent authority of the health authorities. It's it, because we are concerned, we are rejecting the, or we seem to be rejecting the educational efforts being brought to bear to try to keep, to try to keep the community safe. Uh, would, would you agree? I, I, I think that it's deeper than that. I think, um, this is not a unique position to Bahamians. This is a worldwide phenomenon. You need only look at uh, France. Uh, uh, Macron yesterday would have uh, declared uh, a uh, policy that was decidedly against anybody who was not vaccinated. And you had millions of uh, French people take to the streets in active protest. Mm -hmm. And so um, the getting back to this discussion about the juxtaposition of politics, social media, and health policy, uh, and we literally 
uh, have to be innovative and creative and aggressive every single day to reach people where they need to be because uh, the failure to do that uh, results in the dismal performance of Bahamians in taking up vaccines at 9.6%. But it also sets us up for failure because none of the advances that we have made recently economically can be sustained if we have a re-emergence of COVID. And so the peculiar problem is that any political gain that you may want to take uh, from the COVID issue is a bit self-serving because um, uh, the net effect is that the country suffers. And so while we all have differently done, fundamentally, this is really an issue more than any other issue that we have got to figure out how we transcend uh, the political divide and uh, agree uh, on a national way forward. And so I happen to like the idea of the um, expiration of the emergency orders. And uh, hopefully this gives us an opportunity now to put our heads together for a consensus view on how we should collectively govern ourselves. Mm. Um, but 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 let, let's let's be okay. So obviously we don't want to be paternalistic. We don't want to take the position that the 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 government, uh, any government, is 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 right to tell the citizen how to live or what. But by the same token, is it not the duty? as Macron clearly felt in France, and as other leaders around the world have felt, is it not the duty of the political directorate to take a hard line in the face of what is what, what, it, what can be perceived as a lackadaisical uh, response from the public? Well, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. The question is, the carrot going to be more effective or the stick? And um, I say the end, forgive me for cliche after cliche after cliche, mm -hmm. but the end justifies the means. So if you find that a uh, empathetic, compassionate, um, non-judgmental approach to an individual's concern, me and my black brethren, or that uh, this thing is dangerous, uh, that we, um, meet you where you are, and then try to, without dismissing your um, concern as being a stupid um, uh, position to hold, uh, we, we, we try to um, get you to understand why that is not the case. And one by one, we move the Bahamas from 9.6% to 10%, to 12%, to 18%, to 30%, et cetera, um, I think what we, what we really want is to get all of the ideas on the table uh, because the paternalistic, uh, you know, let me um, coerce you into doing what I think you should do hasn't worked very well. Let me read a number to you that I don't think gets enough play. Uh, the, the, the total number of recovered cases is 12,108. Uh, and the total number of active cases is 1,100. Now, you as the, as the, the, the super professional king, king, king making uh, minister, former minister of health could, can give me the, the political neophyte some, some context for those numbers. Because uh, what? How do I interpret active cases at eleven hundred versus uh, thirteen thousand overall cases or a hundred new cases today? So let's start with the thirteen and a half thousand confirmed active cases, which is probably an underrepresentation of the authority you uh, refer to. The actual number of cases in the Bahamas likely to be 
anywhere between three and ten times that amount. Okay. Don't, so don't, don't, don't go on. Let's let's let, if we can have this conversation, let's 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 really flesh it out. Why why is that so? Because um, there are many people who uh, would have suffered from COVID and not necessarily been tested. Mm -hmm. Whether because they didn't want to be tested, were afraid to be tested, couldn't afford to be tested, didn't have access to testing, whatever. Uh, but there are certainly sizable numbers of people who have had COVID who are not in that confirmed number. Okay? And um, the, it, it certainly is at least twice, probably at least three times, and possibly as much as 10 times. And I don't think that I have gone outside of uh, every country. And if you look at a country like India, uh, where they have billions of people, their confirmed caseload is certainly a fraction of the actual number of not only confirmed cases, but deaths. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, um, if you then look at uh, the number of people recovered, I am not sure I know what recovery predicts. We do know that there is natural immunity, both antibody and T cell mediated um, protection from COVID. However, COVID has evolved. So uh, if you were infected with the ancestral strain of COVID, meaning the Wuhan COVID, clear cut protection, robust protection against that strain. You will probably have less protection against the alpha strain or the beta strain or now the delta variant. And we now have a delta plus variant. And the reason is because as these viruses mutate, the spike protein changes and the antibodies no longer attach to the spike proteins as well. And so even though the uh, immunity that you may have, either natural immunity or vaccine created immunity is pretty good, it's not gonna be as good for the Delta variant as it was for the ancestral Wuhan strain or whatever strain was used to create the vaccine. Okay, so of these thousands of persons that are recovered with a different strain, and not only are they at risk for getting COVID again, they are still at risk of dying, as we have seen in the Bahamas, of people getting second infections and dying from COVID. Mm -hmm. And so if if we want to finish this particular point on recovered persons, I would say to those people who have had COVID, taken their beating, uh, recovered, go and get vaccinated. Because uh, you want to maximize, optimize your ability to fight off any other strain of COVID that's coming down the road. And then finally, the active cases. So. We have a number of active cases, some thousand or so. Uh, a number of them are ill enough to be hospitalized. In a hospital system nationally that is concentrated in Grand Bahama and New Providence, New Providence. And I will tell you that um, it has been a phenomenal strain on the people that have been caring for COVID patients and they deserve nothing less than our absolute gratitude. They're tired, they're exhausted. They are, um, they're working incredibly long hours. And I don't think they're gonna be able to continue at this pace uh, indefinitely. And I say that because I work COVID cases every day. And I would have done procedures on two COVID patients this morning uh, before going to mass. Uh, we have a lot of very ill patients and um, to single out nurses, uh, people may get offended, but what they are doing right now is nothing short of remarkable. 
And when the numbers go up and they get called back in for shifts five days a week, six days a week, uh, it is a phenomenal toll, personal toll that they pay. So don't, don't believe for one second right now that we're in a good place. We're not. The, uh, to, a, to an extent, it's a numbers game, right? Uh, it, so so you, uh, you would be able to tell me uh, with, a, with a degree of, of accuracy how many beds we have in the public health system. Uh, and, uh, and how that number of beds holds up against 1,100 active cases of something as care, uh, care heavy as COVID. So let me, let me give you some perspective. Mm -hmm. We have a beautiful intensive care unit at Princess Margaret Hospital, sensibly 20 beds. Today, it can only open to take care of 11 patients. Why? Because we have lost so many critical care nurses. And I am advised that we have a number who have since resigned and are awaiting their last day at work. And so that number is gonna go down even more. The same is true in the private sector. When you look at the number of nurses with critical care training available to take care of COVID patients that are ventilated, that are on high flow oxygen, that are on uh, vasopressors to maintain their blood pressure, we don't have anywhere near the number of nurses or respiratory techs that we need. So this is not an issue of beds. We got more than enough beds. We got more than enough ventilators. If that's not the problem. The problem is the human, these beds. And yes, we have student nurses that are training and there's no pejorative intended when I say, if you wanna win the high jump, you need one person who could jump seven foot, not seven who can jump one foot, okay? So you don't need a trainee nurse. You need a seasoned ICU nurse to take care of these patients, half of whom are gonna die without expert care. And that is where we are. So even when you give the best possible care with the best complement of staff and the best support with respiratory therapists and uh, physician care and uh, medications, dexamethasone, uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies and remdesivir and whatever else you want to put at these patients, the, lim the rate limiting factor right is pirated to go to the United States and elsewhere is nurses. And so every time you go out to that junk new rush out, or you go out to that drink out and you're laughing and coughing with your friends, think about those individuals that are going to care for you if you happen to be one of those sick people that get COVID. So it's not a bad thing. It's a nurse. Not a bad, it's not a bad issue. It's a human resource issue. Mm -hmm. And we can't fix this problem overnight. As a matter of fact, without some very, very, very uh, soul searching decision making, we can't fix this problem uh, at all. Um, there will have to be a critical reassessment of the value of nurses in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. I experience in the ICU and her take home salary is less than $40,000 a year. Okay. Now that same nurse can go to the United States today, today, get a signing bonus of 10,000 or $15,000 and make a hundred thousand dollars a year. And many of our young recently graduated nurses are doing exactly that. And so this is an existential issue. Uh, as a country, we now have to look at the net 
or relative value of nurses, and in particular critical care nurses, ICU nurses, emergency nurses, dialysis nurses, operating theater nurses, and say, are we going to be able to have the capacity to run a health system, particularly given the COVID reality? Bear in mind that we happen to have the sickest workers. We got the most high blood pressure, the most obesity, the most diabetes, the most heart disease, et cetera. I could go on and on and on. And one of the most violent. So when you put that mix together and you add COVID into this and you shake this up, you've got a disaster. And so what we ought, what we think we can tolerate in terms of uh, behavior and COVID protocols or lack of protocols, we cannot tolerate it. But, but, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I quit. The, I, mean, I, I, I hate to, that, that's the way it is. No, 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 no. See, that's what I'm saying, right? For me, I'm all about reality. But I'm also, because as I'm listening to you, I'm trying to imagine the policymaker response, the, the objective reality outside of political considerations. This is simply, these are the facts, make of them what you will. The, the only response is pay nurses more or recruit nurses from elsewhere uh, and, and still you got to pay them more. And you probably have to end up doing both. But beyond that, where are you going to get the money to pay the nurses more? Um, and, and, and so now what, it, what, what is ostensibly starting as a health conversation, a public health conversation, now becomes, now it's a tax conversation. Now it's an economic, an economic structure conversation. So when we talk about health in all policies and we look at the uh, interconnectedness, of, uh, it is a lot more complicated than it appears on the surface. Uh, in my uh, contribution in the House of Assembly for the budget debate, I said that a promise of free care for all means suboptimal care for most. And so you are going to have to figure out how you can adjust the revenue stream for our healthcare system in a progressive way so that those people that are insured or have the means contribute significantly to the health system in order to take care of those that don't. What we have done is we have relied on a historic model where very few people pay anything. So let me give you an example. Tonight, heaven forbid, one of us requires an ICU stay. And we chose to go to the hospital, typically pay anywhere between three to $5,000 a night for a bed. If we went to the hospital that's a little bit west on Shirley Street, the maximum allowable bill, even for a patient with insurance, is $300. Okay? Now, how can that be? I got insurance. The insurance company wants to pay. They will pay anyway. Same doctor, same drugs, same treatment, et cetera. But one facility can charge 5,000, 3,000, 6,000 a night. The other one is mandated not to charge even the insured patient more than $300. Um, so what does that mean? It means that that healthcare system is chronically underfunded. So it's not an issue of billing people that can't afford to pay. It's a matter of, and, and bear in mind that the government of the Bahamas pays officers for teachers, for politicians, I could go on and on, right? Uh, to the tune of some 90 million plus dollars per year. That's above and beyond what we put into the um, um, Subvention for Health, PHA, Department of Public Health. Imagine if you captured some of that money as opposed to sending it to Cleveland Clinic, Jackson Memorial, uh, or elsewhere. Now, 
you could potentially retain 10 or 20 more ICU nurses, 10 or 15 more dialysis nurses, upgrade and maintain the equipment a little bit better. It's a conversation that we have to have, understand that we also spend some 400 to $500 million in South Florida, in part because many Bahamians don't have confidence in their healthcare system. And so if we could repatriate 100 or $200 million of that spend to the Bahamas, you solve your problem. So, okay. I am, I am going to do a thing that I generally do not do and uh, uh, speak about my, my day job in this context. Uh, but because of a decision that was made in 2005, between 2050, between 2005 and 2000, Bahamas Power and Light slash BEC uh, gave up nearly $990 million in revenue because the, the rates were cut without a rate study and subsequent administrations. And today you have a facility, a, a company that is only now being able to turn the corner after, <laughs> after taking a beating for investing uh, almost $100 million in a new power station and, and, and doing some, some things to try and turn things around. But could you imagine if that $990 million had been present in the BEC slash BPL, so there may not even have ever need, been a need for BPL, frankly speaking. BEC was a profit-making company, the best company to work at in the, in the it was it won, it had, had won awards for services. So I, I hear what you are saying uh, about public health and I hear it in a much larger context. It seems that we have a, a process and attempting to deliver political outcomes without really counting the cost and, and without really considering what it is that we are potentially robbing our communities of. Amen. The tough decisions, the tough medicine is oftentimes uh, exactly what's ailing us or what will fix what's ailing us. And I think um, that if you look at the BPL experiment, uh, it has been quietly changing the uh, experience that people have had. So now you see, and I know you didn't uh, uh, introduce this for any gratuitous uh, uh, back padding, no. but if you, if you look at the, at the cost of energy in the Bahamas right now, it is drops of megawatt available online all the time. It is dramatically better than it has been in God knows how long. And um, quietly, just as the landfill has no longer become an, uh, a painful reminder of inertia or paralysis of governance, BPL is quickly becoming a success story. Quietly, we don't talk about it because it's not topical, but it's quietly becoming a success story. And uh, I think uh, the airport is another example. If you remember the airport of old when every bathroom was stink and nasty and dirty, and uh, when you tried to leave the parking lot, if you could find your car and if it had all the hubcaps on, uh, the uh, person working the booth would have to run from one side to the next because they couldn't afford uh, to have anybody there. And um, we're all proud of LPIA. It's beautiful, it's clean, it's consistent, uh, and it's a pleasure to go through that airport. And then what it took was a policy decision to say that, hey, we can do better. Um, and I think that's the, 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 what we need to be doing for nation building. 
it is making some difficult decisions that are iconoclastic, that break the mold of this the way we used to do it. And we've been doing it like this from us. When I was a child, and that's how I learned how to do it. And 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 peep this mama things and, and and don't mess with it. No, it ain't waking. And it's a disservice. I speak about, and forgive me, I, I get a little passionate about this. I speak about the maintenance of medical apartheid in the Bahamas. I am now, I've been here 25 years, as a, 26 years as a practicing physician. I am not going to rest until we abandon medical apartheid. And that is the concept of pub, where you can have a bunch of people jerk up on a little private, a public ward, okay? And they don't know when they can get in the operating room. They don't know when they can get a test done and so on and so forth, because that's the best we can do. And then right next door, you have this lovely uh, private wing where and on demand, people can get services, okay? Um, it is an anomaly that we have maintained, uh, and I want to see the backside of it before I retire or before I go to my eternal reward, whether that's north or south, okay? You, you continue to, 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 to address certain things we find out how soon it could be before you go to your eternal reward. You know <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but seriously, I feel that's, that's to my, to you said about being unable to afford to give the care that we we are promising people not because it's not a not because of beds or ventilators but because we can't pay nurses is and, and medical technicians and whatnot it, it's to me it's symptomatic of the ultimate problem with the bahamas which is that there's a promise that our politicians continue to make which is that you don't have to pay and whatever, whatever, however you finish the sentence, once the sentence begins with, you don't have to pay, whatever comes next is a lie, right? It, it, because ultimately, if you, even if you don't pay, you're not going to get what you are being promised because nobody believes that you're getting a law, in my experience, uh, I, I've had both sides of it. You know, there are certain medical practitioners now, if I see them in a dark alley, you know, you all might have to come visit me in, 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 in Fox Hill Prison. Don't get locked up. Don't get locked up. But, get but I'm locked. serious. And I'm, my family knows this. If I, that's why I don't call the name. But but I've also seen, uh, I mean, tremendous, absolute professional care with that that rivals what I, what I saw in at Children's National Medical Center in, in Washington, D.C., which is one of the world's foremost specialist hospitals. So I know that it's not a question of the skill or, or the, 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 the personnel qualifications of our, our practitioners. It has to be that the system is beat to shit, excuse my language. It, and, and, and as a result, you were the Minister of Health. I can imagine around the cabinet table, because uh, some, some of your, your colleagues uh, are, are known to me. Uh, so I could imagine that there were a number of frank conversations about who need money and who got too much money as it is. How is it that you could let fellas get up from the table without taking the money from them by force, if you have to, to fix the public health system? Well, you know, cabinet is an interesting place. And uh, there are some very, very candid, I want you to think about all the possible synonyms for candid conversations mm -hmm. to take place at that table. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you walk away from that table, you speak with one voice. And whether you just cuss somebody uh, or not, at the end of the day, you're on the same team. And you've agreed that uh, whatever we decide collectively, that's what we're going with. Okay? 
um, and you win some and you don't win some. And that is the model that we use. It has served us quite well in, in some instances. Um, and that's the model for the foreseeable future we're going to continue with. Um, yeah, I hear you, but I mean, you know, you know, Prime Minister is also... Sorry, go ahead. And they can justify why they should get that extra dollar or that extra $10 or that extra million dollars because they have, we need a new prison. We got to do better schools. We need a couple of bridges. Uh, we could use some more hospital infrastructure. And I could go on and on and on. Um, and, you know, that cuss word that's called taxation is a, is, is, is a big cuss word uh, that... Uh, people don't have a whole lot of appetite for and is, as church, uh, a difficult situation. you got to grow your way out of it. So um, it's, uh, unfortunately, uh, sometimes things don't happen as quickly as they have to happen or ought to happen. And yet that is the process of building a nation. The United States talks about a more perfect union. They certainly, they don't have it together yet, and yet they are one of the models that we adore. Um, you name a country that's got everything together or got it right, and I'll show you utopia. That's the only place. Mm -hmm. um, but we've got to keep trying, and uh, all of us, you are doing your part, I'm doing my part. Um, you know, the, the politics is the model or the or the path to get a seat to the at the table yeah so that you can have uh i've had a seat at the highest table um it was a privilege uh it ended prematurely but certainly i look back at that experience and said hey you know um i understand how it works i understand why it works that way and uh, if it is the will of the people and the grace of God, I may have an opportunity to sit at that table again. Um, we'll see. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, we got to go to the people and say, are you prepared to throw them another blow to let me represent you for five more years? Mm -hmm. And that comes first. Because without that, the other thing can't happen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's a when we get to the when we get to the uh, the, the canvassing question. That's there's this thing that people have, right? Um, this idea of national service, this wonderful idea that I want to be a politician so that I can uh, write laws and so that I can, you know, write policy and so that I could uh, create a, a, a cultural and, uh, a, and, and uh, musical utopia, um, where a place, a place where a person like me who grew up on music doesn't have to go away to to contemplate making a living as a musician um just as a by as a an aside to, to all of my all of my listeners who have kids who are playing musical instruments you should you should go and look at the salaries for principal musicians in some of these orchestras around the world uh the principal clarinetist the first chair clarinetist uh, at a typical symphony orchestra makes $70,000 a year just to play the clarinet, right? The, the, the principal violinists, uh, they make more because, you know, the violin is your primary instrument of, of your orchestra. The principal brass players, they make about eight, uh, outlier salaries. That's the salary range. If you're playing in the London Symphony Orchestra or you're playing in Berlin or you're playing in Chicago Symphony Orchestra, you're easily over six figures a year as a, as a first chair instrumentalist. So the, the, the world is, the world out there recognizes the kind of talent that we have in abundance. And if you look at a Bahamian band, though every band is populated by um, people who are virtuoso wind players or virtuoso brass players, if they knew or if their music teachers knew, they could send those people around the world to be making six-figure salaries like that. But we don't value that enough here. Nope. So they can work in the hotel or they can get a job as a, 
and they see if they could get a job as a teacher for a little while and what the case may be. But if they, if they knew what was out there in the world, for the same effort, they could make six-figure salary with the same talent that they have. And, and, and we have this, and it's not, I mean, I, I'm, I see it in music because that's my field. But it's, there is something about the, the vast experience available in, in the world that we as, as, a, as a country, we have this talent pool in so many different areas. It's just bubbling around, but we don't recognize or value it. And as a result, people come and pick off, right? They come and pick off your nurses because those people, they, it isn't just training, it's character. You, you, you and I know that nurses are not about training and equipment. A nurse is a character issue. All over the world, they end up in leadership positions. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I have uh, a medical professional that we uh, generally reimburse at less than $40,000 a year, who now uh, in the U.S. makes $1,000 a day, $1,000 a day. I didn't, I didn't misspeak, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and they are picking these people off, left, right, and center, because they bring phenomenal work ethic, leadership, drive, compassion to the table. Um, and uh, the models that we use uh, puts us in a position that we oftentimes have great difficulty competing with uh, being in the same league and we kind of like to look at this sleepy little fishing village uh approach mm -hmm. so um i i think you know in the next 48 years um you know we've, we've got to fast forward this little bahamas into something different yeah and singapore rise or uh estonia Uh, all right, folks. Um, so, sorry, Dr. Sands, we're having some, some internet connectivity issues here. So, um, let's, let's take a quick break. Uh, it's, a, it's the top of the hour anyway. Uh, so, folks, uh, we'll be back on the uh, other side of this break. Uh, I'm talking to Dr. Dwayne Sands, the, uh, the Member of Parliament for the constituency of Elizabeth. Uh, and uh, on the other side of the break, we're going to get down to some of the politics on the ground and see, uh, see how things are going. Uh, Dr. S Elevated mobile experience with BTC giving you unlimited talk for the best conversations, unlimited data for all your online fun, and unlimited roaming to stay connected while overseas. For, for just $50, $50 per line, unlock unlimited mobile talk, data, and roaming when you sign up for BTC super fast fiber internet with speed starting at 100 megabits per second. Enjoy more great savings and value. Upgrade or sign up today. Visit any BTC store or btcbahamas.com. Conditions apply. When does a simple meal become? 
become exceptional? You guessed it, when it's made the fresh market way. We're talking exquisite cuts of fresh meat, succulent fresh seafood options, the best in fresh produce, and who can forget our exotic spices and herbs? Come on, get ready to shake up your taste buds and let our aisles inspire your inner food genius. Homemade salted caramel ice cream, mmm, mmm. Remember, go fresh and craft delicious with Fresh Market. This is Guardian Radio 96.9 FM, Nassau, Bahamas. To the political review. Uh, my name is Kay Quincy Parker. It is Sunday, the 18th of July, two minutes gone past five o'clock, and we are live on Guardian, www.guardiantalkradio.com. And uh, we're also, uh, you can listen to us live on cable, uh, nine, channel 969. And uh, there are, I'm sure, many other ways uh, of accessing this uh, this wonderful stream and wonderful feed. Uh, the conversation is about to take a turn because we're about to ask uh, the the immortal Dr. Duane Sands uh, whether or not he is, uh, he is finding positive and encouraging signs on the ground as he is moving throughout uh, his constituency of Elizabeth, because uh, I have seen uh, on Facebook his opponent uh, moving, and uh, that, that means that they've decided to bring out the big guns uh, against Dr. Sands. Uh, and uh, are you are you finding yourself uh, uh, under 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 threat, or you you are you are you are finding yourself in in good shape? In, in Elizabeth. Well, let me let me let me uh, preface my comments by saying that you know few fishermen find their fish stink, right? And mm -hmm. so when you ask a politician, and heaven forbid, you know, this eleven years I've been doing this now, and I guess that makes me a politician or twelve yes. years. Um, you, you are a politician, Doctor Sands. Just mm -hmm. it's, yeah. <laughs> the response that I have found on the ground. And I said this to my team yesterday was surprisingly positive. Um, and we were in the belly of the beast, as it were. We went to Elizabeth Estate unfiltered. Uh, we went to every door, uh, was amazingly positive. Um, and you know, it's it's been 12 years that I have been talking with uh these people and um They've seen me lose. They've seen me win. They've helped me to win. Uh, and they've also seen what's happened over the last four years. And so, um, you know, you, we are working. Uh, I've got a pretty incredible team on the ground. And, um, you know, I, I don't wish uh, Senator uh, Colby Davis any ill will. I, I wish her well um, that she can expect from me a clean, fair fight but I expect her to learn what it is to lose an election. <laughs> That's uh, not a pleasant... Uh... Right now, where I was sitting the night of the returns for the by-election. Um, and at the end of that return, we were ahead, if you remember. We had a razor-thin margin. And then I sat in election court for week after week after week, only to be told, well, you know, uh, the court has ruled against you and you have lost the by-election in Elizabeth. And then I could remember the drubbing that we took as a party <laughs> in 2012. That was a cut hip uh, of, you know, historic proportions. And so when we were listening to the returns in 2017. 
uh, I was sitting with Alex Storr and his uh, campaign uh, team. And it was just a, a small group of us. And it, it became pretty clear pretty soon that we had won. And I remembered how I felt. Um, you know, we're not enemies. We're not enemies. We are opponents. As a matter of fact, Alex Storr's wife is is my god sister. Uh, what I realized was important was to uh, reassure him that, look, um, today it's me. And, um, you know, who knows what the electorate is going to do whenever the next election is called. I hope that I am able to uh, provide them with enough reason to reelect me. I hope that they, that as a party, we are able to provide them with enough reasons to elect a majority of us to uh, form the government of the Bahamas. Uh, but that's a combination of the individual, uh, the, their views of the party, their views of the leader, uh, their views of their own personal service. And many, many, many good PLP, uh, that's almost an oxymoron, a eh? good PLP, but good PLP <laughs> candidates uh, got rolled out. Uh, in the last uh, election because they got beat with the uh, Right Honorable uh, Perry Christie stick. That is, uh... okay, so, so you have opened Pandora's box. Uh, the, there is a, there is a strain of FNM parliamentarian circa 2017 to 2022, uh, who believes they won the election? And who appreciates that even PLPs voted against the PLP in the last election, and that it was much, much more a rejection of Mr. Christie than anything else. The way our elector, the way our electorate works. Generally, they vote you out. They're not, they're not really voting anybody in, right? Uh, but it, it presented the, the Minnis administration with a practical clean slate. And you had the vast majority. Uh, you had a very clear mandate, 30, 35 to 4. You had... Um, uh, an almost clean slate to do whatever took uh, took root in, I guess, as a minister wanted to do, you could do, and whatever you as a government overall wanted to do, you could do. But there was this, er, early on, there was this sense that there wasn't a plan, right? People, people kept saying, show me the plan, show me the plan. And then as as the administration developed and people started to fall away, even some of them were saying, show me the plan, show me the plan, right? My, my question uh, about what you're finding on the ground is, is kind of related to that in the sense that this time it's not about Christie, right? The boogeyman is gone. This time, uh, and to my mind, Minnis doesn't, doesn't have the, the most honorable, excuse me, uh, does not or Ingram have. So I think this is much more about candidates than it is about leaders in, in most of the places where there are strong candidates. Where there are not, where there are candidates who nobody knows, then obviously, you know, it's about the choice between Brave and Menace. But you and you and the good senator are both well-known individual. So this, this is a fist fight between the two of you all. Um, and, and in that circumstance, do you think that the, that the, the last three and a half years have, have provided you with enough to, to, win, to win that battle? Because I know some who, I know some who rest 35 to four. 
And those, those people are in trouble now because they didn't do any work. And they're vulnerable when they could have been killing it and, and being invulnerable. So that's why I'm asking you the question. Well, certainly I have looked at this opportunity for the last four years and realized how important it was for people to know where you stood, why you stood where you stood, and to try and have people view me as somebody with integrity. Um, and to uh, have an opportunity, even as a member of a team, to look at me as an individual. And I think uh, certainly that uh, they have more than enough information to uh, compare Dwayne Sands and his records on um, uh, matters of uh, public interest. Um, certainly, Dwayne Sands has not been shy about uh, expressing his views um, uh, publicly, uh, whether good, bad, or, or ugly. Um, I have tried to be as honest with uh, particularly my constituency, but uh, the people of the Bahamas, so that they don't have this taste in their mouth and say, mm, they're salty or sweet. I don't, I think they know what they're getting when they get a Dwayne Sands. Um, I am not so convinced that when they do that taste test with my primary uh, opponent, that they know where she stands. Uh, and unfortunately, I think her historic position um, and uh, being tied up with uh, oil in the Bahamas is a difficult position. It's, it's, it's going to be for her a very difficult thing to say, hey, this is who I am, really. This is where I stand. This is what I believe in. Uh, because uh, she is coming into um, a community where, where she's, not, she's not known. This is not her community. Uh, and, um, you know, she is attempting to um, present herself as an alternative to somebody who has tried and true and known. So... It, it, it's very, very challenging. It's going to be a challenging task for her, um, you know, but, you know, in terms of political sportsmanship, um, you know, may the better person win. Now, we have other candidates. You got Craig Bow, and you have a couple of, you have a DNA candidate and um, uh, DeVoe, uh, and somebody from the Coalition of Independence that's also running. Yes. Um, you know, we've been on this road before. In the by-election, we had uh, Andre Rollins, Rodney Munker, Cassius Stewart. Uh, we had a whole bunch of people running, some of whom got 10 votes, some got 60, some got 25. Made a difference, obviously, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, while they may have contributed to the outcome, none of them were in the running. So, you know, you've you got to take this all on because who knows what the public is going to do for a uh, a vote for a Craig Bow or uh, a DNA candidate. Uh, I think we lost the 2012 election in large part because of support thrown towards the DNA. I think... Uh, the DNA vote in 2012 changed and allowed the PLP to emerge victorious. Um, and we ignored the DNA um, at our own peril in 2012. We ain't going to ignore them now. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I don't believe uh, that this is going to be a, a, a race in terms of the, the greatest number of voters between anybody other than Dwayne Sands and Joe Beth Colby Davis. The, this, this actually precipitates uh, one of my other questions. Given the, as you mentioned, the, the fact that the DNA, well, one fact, but the, certainly it's arguable that the DNA did swing the election to the PLP the last go around. Um, 
that was different leadership, right? Uh, to have taken on a different character with uh, with Komalafi's leadership. Uh, so, so, do you? And this is this is just a, a curiosity type question. Obviously, you don't think they're going to do it, Elizabeth. But do you think they're going to win a seat? No, I don't. I don't. I don't think they're going to win a single seat, and I don't think. Uh, um, any, maybe, maybe the leader will get her deposit back. Maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but she um, running in Carmichael, you know? The, the, I said maybe she'll get a deposit back. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that standard is not that great, eh? Mm -hmm. uh, for, for that return. So when you, when you look at the DNA, and if I can speak very candidly, they seem this monkey on their back where they're in the news for something totally unrelated to policy, totally unrelated to position. It's this person is defecting, this person is fighting, this person is leaving, and so on and so forth. They have not been able to field a full slate of candidates for the first time in, in uh, three elections. And so uh, I think that... Uh, the DNA's uh, impact on the body politic of the Bahamas um, has come full circle and probably will end this election cycle. Hmm. That is... All right, so I'm going to write that down. Dwayne Sands says no more DNA after 2022. Okay. <laughs> I've written it down. That's in the... Okay. In the, yeah. Uh, Looking at the looking at the tea months ago, I had uh, I had the uh, election tied uh, before the last few candidates for the PLP were ratified, and uh, then about a month ago we did a count, and I had the FNM ahead by two seats before the. Uh, the ratification on uh, on Sunday of the final four, and uh, and generally I, I don't do this with uh, with partisans, but uh, I, I'm curious about whether you what what you think the the outcome is going to be. Well, you know, I'm glad you asked me that question. Okay, mm -hmm. um, I am amazed at the choice of candidates by the PLP. They are in quest. <laughs> so they appear to have been quested on a number of seats. Um, and it's, it's as if, you know, hey, we really, we can put somebody there to hold the place, but we, we are going to base our entire political fortune on uh, a anti-FNM sentiment, and that's going to get us over the hump. Okay. And so when you ask, well, well, who is this person? And um, what does this person stand for? And, you know, uh, people point and say, well, you know, in 2017, you had a number of relative unknowns in the FNM. They may have been politically uh, neophytes or novices, but they were certainly not unknown. It's hard to call a Jeffrey Lloyd an unknown. It's hard to call a Dionisio Diagola an unknown. I could go on and on and on. And so the uh, individuals who have acquitted themselves well in their own right. Come on. Going up against. Let me give you a few examples. Let's look at St. Barnabas. Uh, and there's no neophyte in Alkidas, okay? Oh, yeah. But, um, because of some deal cutting now, he has been taken out of his comfort zone in Golden Isles and mm -hmm. asked to go into a brand new area because you've cut a deal with the incumbent member of parliament. And so now what you have done is you have put him at a decided disadvantage. Why would you take Michael Darville out of Grand Bahama, unless you ran, he got run from Grand Bahama and put him into tall pines. It makes absolutely no sense, okay? 
and in the campaign. That's that very same sentiment. It makes some of these moves make no sense. And and the 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 the, the issue is that that uh, it appears as if the leader is banking on some tsunami, some yellow wave that's going to wash away all of the accomplishments of individuals who have worked tirelessly in the vineyard, in the political vineyard. You look at North, North Eleuthera, and uh, arguably one of the most successful communities economically in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Ricky Mackey has done an incredible job in North Eleuthera. And uh, his political adversary, Clay Sweeting, who has lost North Eleuthera several times now, has run down to the south, where he's an unknown. <laughs> uh, why? Because they knew he could not win North Eleuthera. And uh, it's... The simple answer is, I believe, by the grace of God and with the support of the people of the Bahamas, uh, notwithstanding the challenges that people live and feel every day, uh, we should be returned as the government of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Same majority? No, I don't think so. Um, you know, it's a, it's a difficult thing as a partisan member to um, give... Um, an honest public assessment of how you see things lining up. Because then the suggestion is, oh, you're not truly, um, you know, all for one and one for all. Uh, yeah. so, you know, I, I think that um, there has been some, um, uh, it is as catastrophic as uh, some predict that it has been. And it's a mixed bag in terms of people's perception of our performance. Um, uh, people understand the impact of a Dorian and a, and a COVID. And they see uh, efforts made, sincerity of efforts, how well people responded to their constituents. And believe me, politics is local. So don't care how good you are in cabinet, don't care how good you are as a chairperson, if you have not been working in your constituency, God help you. That is, that that is the that is the 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 question that I that I that I am asking is because I know some everybody knows somebody around and who are not working or have not been working in their community. Let, let's take. Um, <laughs> Let's take Saint Barnabas as you, as you, as you, you mentioned, right? When he, when he first won in there, you know, Shenandoah was very clear. This is a PLP area. I better wake my butt off, and and he certainly did. So Mike uh, Alkidas, a good friend of mine, is going up against somebody who did his best from day one to secure the support of people who normally would not support him. Amen. And and so my, you know, like my understanding was that, you know, a lot of the PLPs told told the, 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 the campaign leadership to send Mike back to, to Golden Isles because they didn't want him to lose. And if he come in and in, in say, Barnum, uh, the relationships that have been uh, developed. And I'm speaking firsthand from uh, people on 3rd and 4th Street to Grove um uh that that you know talk glowing in glowing terms about their interaction with uh shannon don cartwright okay uh the fact that he's down to earth the fact that he's available he's accessible and so on and so forth i believe that he has demonstrated what representation is all about and when i when i i i plagiarize uh some of his uh Activities. I look, I say, let me see what Shannon Dawn doing now. Boy, that's a good <laughs> idea, right? Mm -hmm. I give him props for it. And I say, okay, can we do something similar in, in our community? Uh, he is a bright and rising star in politics. And, you know, you know cream rises to the top, eh? Yes. So, uh, and there are others. Um, I, as 
proverbial twins. I'm talking about the representative for Yamacraw, Ellsworth Johnson. Okay? We share a border on Commonwealth Boulevard. And he is similarly creative. Um, he is um, outspoken. He is candid. Uh, you don't need to guess where he stands. You mightn't agree with him all the time. You mightn't agree with him. Mm -hmm. But uh, certainly, it's not a question whether he's fish or fowl. This is where he stands on a particular matter. And he is decidedly uh, pro-Bahamian. And it's been a pleasure to work with him uh, for these last four and a half years. And I, I believe that he is going to um, uh, school uh, his opponent in the, in, the, in the upcoming election. Yeah. It would have been just just for, for the sake of uh, political uh, enjoyment, it would have been to watch Melanie versus Ellsworth without the Perry Christie vibe. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That would have well, been an interesting you thing. Know, I think, you know, I'm I'm mature enough to say that Melanie Griffith served the people of Yamacraw well. Okay? She did. She, really she did. did. She was she was an excellent representative. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, she was on par with a Janet Boswick, right? Now, when you are Close. We ain't gonna say on par. I mean, come on now. I mean, you don't have to ever say that. What? Yeah, I, I had. To, I'm gonna pull that back. I, I, I withdraw that, Mr. Speaker. Okay. So, <laughs> when you look, however, at the time, I think it's not unreasonable for us to cast our net at new talent, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there's something positive about the trend where we see new faces. Uh, populating the uh, body politic, and yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying that that uh, that they should have, have, have run someone new. I'm just saying, I I was uh, at the time I lived in Yamacro, uh, and it was uh, an interesting oh. election morning. Was fascinating, man, because you know you walked up to the to the polling station at, at St Andrews silent, you know, everybody was just quiet. They were like, oh, and Mal, Mal was standing out front uh, along with Ellsworth. And she looked at me and said, boy, Parker, I know. And I say, well, that ain't got nothing to do with you, right? <laughs> she, let, let, she, let, let me play, let me play uh, with one more, if you don't mind. Mm. Uh, let's go to Freetown, okay? Oh, Lord, hallelujah, yeah. Nobody, nobody, nobody probably anticipated that uh, you know, political beast that he has become. He has taken this thing on, and I think he has done quite well, notwithstanding the fact that it's a very difficult area, particularly with the violence that has occurred in Camp Road over the last six months, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, uh, Wayne Monroe, uh, a good man, um, a gentleman, um, finds himself in the position that I found myself a third time around, uh, never won before. Uh, and this is kind of do or die, right? And I'm afraid that uh, like Patrick Ewing that never won a championship ring, Wayne Monroe will end his political career without a victory politically. So... So it behooves it behooves somebody like Wayne to ask whether the the, the is stars might align might you know <laughs> align my in my favor a little more right because I'm hearing but I mean this you're an F and M I can't really talk to you about this next time I get a, a PLP on I can talk a little bit about this a little bit more but I keep hearing that the decisions that uh, that the, the leader of the opposition is making in terms of uh, who to run where. Are, are riling up, you know, riling up the forces. Yeah, and I, wonder, I mean, uh, you know, the the the, the PLP. Um, well, what's clear is that this is very much about brave Philip Brave Davis and his aspirations to become prime minister, and um, in, one of the most powerful forces in Bahamian politics remains the honourable member for Angliston, who happens mm -hmm. to be my constituent. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and I can put it to her. I can ask you and your God. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, but 
she has been sidelined. And she is the most powerful political force in the Progressive Liberal Party today. Why? Is it just a fear her? Is it, is it uh, I, I would hate to say it's misogyny. I don't believe that political misogyny is real, but it could be. But certainly, uh, why is Glennis Hannah Martin not uh, front, front of stage leading the charge, carrying the banner for the Progressive Liberal Party? Not necessarily as leader, but as an obvious uh, stalwart. And I'm using stalwart in a, in, a, in, a, in a different sense. Certainly, certainly, certainly. So, so, so we're watching this thing play out, and uh, we say, mm -hmm. uh, Glennis look too prime ministerial if they if they give her a, <laughs> if they give her too big a too big a role. You know, she's she ran for leader before, uh, and if you if you, if you put put the campaign in her hands, you can't keep out the chair. Well, I mean, and if you if you look at the the challenge of a of a Philip Brave Davis, uh, he is a shrinking violet. When you put a microphone in front of him, he can't. Um, he just doesn't have it, and um, he has to have on uh, financial matters. Uh, his deputies speak for him, and uh, if we're talking political fight, then the member the member for Engliston is the person to go to. So he's just kind of carrying the title. Yeah, but that's brings, very little, brings very little punch to the party. And, exactly. and potential fortunes of the PLP. And I, I see why they had to bring the right honorable prime minister out of retirement uh, and, and use the playbook that, that we used, OK? Mm -hmm. well, I mean, it worked for you all. So I, I assume they're saying it's going to work for them too. but. It, it's it's a risk, you know. The man was rejected by his entire his entire party, including the people who have kept him in power for twenty years. So, to have his endorsement may not necessarily be uh, the ringing endorsement that, that that Brave wants. I don't know. Well, we talk about any given Sunday. Today is Sunday, and mm -hmm. while there's no football on, on any given Sunday, may the best team win, right? Um, yeah. We are preparing uh, to go to political battle, uh, metaphorically, of course, and uh, uh, the uh, definitive uh, solution of so many issues. Uh, um, and you know, I could I could relate some of them, but you know, you look at the, the improvements in education and, and access to tertiary education. It's it's something that's changed the lives of countless Bahamians. Um, we think uh, that even the management of um, COVID, uh, and yes, people are going to question some of the decisions that we make or that the party has made or that the competent authority has made, um, that, uh, you know, to date, um, the majority of Bahamians, I believe, think that the Bahamas had, has fared reasonably well with COVID. And so, mm -hmm. you know, let's see, let's see uh, what happens in the weeks to come. I've said I think we need to pivot now, but uh, um, let's see what happens. Let's put a point on it, right? Because I don't want it to be said that you you were on my show and you, you're speaking out of both sides of your mouth. The, the, the whole first hour was about how difficult a position we are in vis-a-vis -vis right. COVID-19 and this pandemic. Uh, yet you are now saying that despite the difficulty of the position that we are, we are in, you think that the administration has handled COVID. Well, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I rather let, me, let, me, let, let me say it, that mm -hmm. we have been dealing with COVID now since March 15th, well, and even before uh, March of 2020. And if you look at the public's response to the administrative uh, approach or government approach to COVID. And I led that charge uh, for times when it wasn't so positive. I am saying that in the net up until this current point, the 
Bahamian public's perception of the management of COVID has been positive, okay? Mm -hmm. And I am also saying that where we are right now, we're not in a good spot, okay? And how we manage COVID today, tomorrow, next week may change the net opinion of Bahamians in terms of the COVID issue, okay? It's not fluid. Uh, but no, it's not a matter of speaking out of both sides of your mouth. It's a matter of looking at uh, the fact that we have been dealing with this thing now for some uh, 16 months. And we have ebbed and flowed and ebbed and flowed. And in the net, we're at a certain point. We're here now. I'm suggesting we got to go left or go right and not continue down this current path. Mm -hmm. And um, you know the public will. And your your uh, your suggestion of either left or right is uh, how how does it jibe with the recommendations of the the medical authorities that are informing the competent authority? I don't know. I I don't know because uh, I I'm not a part of that team. Mm -hmm. I do I do form a part of the medical team that takes care of COVID patients. And as such, um, uh, clearly have uh, knowledge of the views of the majority of the practitioners that care for COVID patients. And many of them are leaders in their own right, and they are not shy about expressing their views. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, and they are incredibly competent and capable clinicians, whether they're nurses, physiotherapists, uh, doctors, we see things well before uh, people see it on Meeting Street. And so while we may be saying something today, uh, the reports may not uh, coalesce for days, if not weeks. And so uh, a comment that is made uh, by a somebody who is actively involved in the care of COVID patients may reflect the experience that they have personally had yesterday, the day before, last week, last month, and they're watching the trends. I, I am, I think every Bahamian is obviously invested in the, the best possible outcome of, uh, for us, dealing with this pandemic that I am not certain that we have a clear idea what that what that is. So in in your in your experience with your with your knowledge, your your involvement, your understanding, what's the best possible outcome for for the Bahamas vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19 and this pandemic? Well I, I think that, and, and I will make, uh, some of this will be my recommendations about things that we have to do. We, we have to, we have and we must, um, we, we have to get people um, vaccinated. Uh, and whatever it takes to uh, overcome the vaccine hesitancy, uh, including uh, providing an alternative to the existing sole option, access to vaccines uh, to allow general practitioners and primary care physicians to get involved uh, because people trust them um, uh, to help them to make some of the difficult decisions. They trust them with their diabetes and their high blood pressure and their cancer and so on. So they'll trust them with their decision about should I get vaccinated. Mm. Um, I think uh, we've got to do a better job of testing uh, more consistently uh, so that we know where we are in real time. And uh, I think we are going to have to, uh, by way of legislative uh, edict, uh, outline uh, a set of uh, protocols, rules, as it were, for mask wearing, sanitization, social distancing, et cetera, that entrenches the public health measures that are shown and proven to be effective. Uh, we have gotten very, very lax, very sloppy with them, spacing, church, etc. Uh, and also probably 
um, um, have a working group uh, that we buy into that uh, modifies it over time. And then finally, I'd like to say, in the political season, we have an opportunity to demonstrate real bipartisanship or multipartisanship about the rules of engagement. Uh, COVID is real. And you have people going door to door. We ought to meet, certainly the major parties and, you know, whomever, and agree rules of engagement uh, as to how we should interact with the public to ensure safety for the voting population as well as for the people that are canvassing. I think the public deserves that. And it would be uh, happen in very short order. Uh, and it would give confidence to Bahamians about um, how serious we are about protecting this democratic right to uh, exercise your franchise. That, that, those are steps to take. But my, I guess my, my question was, what's, 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 the, what's the outcome? What does it look like? Uh, what does success look like? Well, su success is uh, continued economic growth and activity, return of our tourism product, and a diminution to a manageable safe level in terms of number of cases, but more importantly, number of hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, it's any death is a dwelling majority of Bahamians uh, who are eligible to be vaccinated, vaccinated, certainly adults. Um, I think we can look at the success stories from countries around the world uh, as to what that threshold should be. Uh, and even though the Delta variant has uh, thrown a wrench into the works. It doesn't seem to have thrown a wrench into the works in terms of hospitalizations and deaths. Mm. So success for the Bahamas will be uh, hotel rooms or beds filled, people back to work, unemployment uh, back down below 10%, uh, people not getting kicked out of their homes uh, because they don't have the means to pay their mortgage or rent. Uh, schools being able to resume face-to-face -face activity and not Zoom meetings. Um, COVID-managed Bahamian reality looks like. Mm. The <laughs> there is a frightening, frighteningly little in the way of uh, expectation for an expiration date <laughs> in, in what you have said, Dr. Sands. Uh, you, in fact, when you talk about entrenching uh, the COVID protocols and law, that, I mean, we, we are, we are, you are talking about fundamentally altering the way we live with no expiration date attached. Family over and over and over against continuance of the emergency orders speaks for itself, okay? And so I have no problem at all with the expiration of the emergency orders. I, I welcome it. I believe that we can do uh, as well, if not better, with uh, um, codification of our uh, approach to COVID or any similar um, public health threat uh, that does not interfere as significantly with uh, personal liberty, constitutional rights of the individual. But bear in mind that we have surrendered much because of COVID. And, you know, people uh, forget that, you know, I was the person that uh, seconded the original seconded. I was the Minister of Health at the time. I have no regrets, none whatsoever. Uh, 
it was necessary at the time. But now we need to move on. It's 18 months later and uh, it has fulfilled whatever utility it had, uh, time for a different model. Which will be no less restrictive. Uh, I think it will be uh, less restrictive, but it cannot be business as usual. Uh, business as usual will not return until we have a thorough and complete grip on this scourge. And there's no country that has a grip on this scourge, none. Countries that thought they had this thing under wrap now find themselves with Australia. Uh, Australia's back in lockdown in some places. So um, as this virus changes, you have to be willing to respond. But I do not believe that, um, that uh, curtailment of civil liberties is something that ought to exist for longer than a fixed time, a limited time. And I think that that time has expired. What happens, what happens in the inevitable circumstance that we let the, 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 uh, the emergency orders expire and there's a spike in the number of COVID cases? Then, then one of the things that you do is you put your duly elected on in a timely fashion um, you know, um, the, and, 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 and this comes directly from one of my contributions. I, I, I think that, uh, the 5,000 voters in each constituency want to have a voice as to how their affairs are going to be managed. Okay. Yes. They agreed to uh, cancellation of some of their constitutional rights for a period. But now moving forward, now that this thing is clearly going to take us beyond and beyond, they need to have their voices back. And this is about the protection of democracy. So uh, it may seem unwieldy, it may seem uh, challenging, but hey, that is what elected members of parliament were elected to do, to run the affairs of the people that they are privileged to serve. Part where you address this, this whole question of, of democracy versus public health. Uh, is, 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 is it because that's, that's, that is what the argument seems to be. The argument seems to be on the one hand, you can have your civil liberties. On the other hand, you can have your public health, but you can't have both. I, I disagree. I think what it turns on is your definition of an emergency. How long does an emergency last? We have been through World War I, we've been through World War II, we've been through uh, Gulf Wars, we've been through uh, all types of bona fide emergencies. We, had the, uh, uh, we have had hurricanes that have been emergencies and so on and so forth. Okay. But I don't believe that they anticipated that those emergencies would last for two years. Because then it's hard to describe it as an emergency. But, but, but isn't, isn't this unprecedented though? I mean, so, so shouldn't the- World, World shouldn't War II was book, unprecedented. Yeah, exactly. And the rule book got tossed out the window because it was unprecedented. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I, I don't think that we have, we have ever invoked uh, these powers for this length of time. Uh, let me say it categorically. We have never invoked these powers and we have a democracy that's almost 600 years old. But, but I'm coming, I, I keep coming back to utility. I appreciate the argument for civil liberties. God knows I appreciate that argument. My, my question is not about whether we, that's, to me, that's the question. Um, I suspect that, um, there will be, um, an, a declaration 
by consensus uh, by one of the uh, international public health bodies that we uh, are a party to that acknowledges that based on this, 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 and this, that the imminent threat of COVID has now uh, passed. And they ring the bell and we move on to the next problem. Um, until that time, however, each country has to decide how it is going to proceed. The UK has said that as of a specific date in August 2021, that they're done, okay? Finish, let the chips fall as they may. We've discussed already a little bit different. Mm -hmm. We are a sovereign nation and we have to decide for ourselves, this is what we are going to do. And I cannot see us uh, moving into a new parliament with the same fettered powers of the uh, legislative pillar of democracy. I cannot see it. But that's a topic for probably a different day. I was about to say that that is the last word on, on, on the day's show, uh, Dr. Sands. Uh, we, uh, we've thoroughly enjoyed our, our conversation as, uh, as you know, our little slogan is no lotion and no long talk. And uh, <laughs> you, you live up to that today. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And Kanda, as usual, we appreciate Building it. a better Bahamas. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there speaks uh, uh, an aspirant to the highest chair in the land, but we'll, uh, we'll leave him alone on that one for now before he gets slings and arrows in places he don't deserve. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dr. Sands. Thank you. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us. Uh, may uh, God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Uh, thank you for tuning in to the Political Review. My name is Quincy Parker. Take care.